Welcome to Circuit Secrets. In this video series, we are going to build a DIY tube preamp. Stick around to find out how to get the schematic and parts layout for free. Learn about this preamp and the basics of tube electronics. In part one of this video series, I will focus on some of the unique traits of this preamp, including the components used, their operation, ratings, and schematic symbols. Before we venture into the tech of yesteryear, you need to be aware of the dangers involved. Vacuum tubes run on dangerously high voltage, thus only qualified and experienced electronics technicians should attempt any such project as outlined in this video series. This thing can maim and kill you. Do not try this at home. You have been warned. Without further ado, on to the specifics of this tube preamp. This preamp uses 112AX7 tube and 112AT7 tube. This preamp has a similar sound to the preamps of yesteryear, because it has a power amplifier output section. The earliest preamps, up through the 60s, had power amplifier output because they were driving mostly inductive loads. Whether they were cutting a record or driving a magnetic tape recording head, there was a power amplifier attached to the output of nearly every preamp. Small power amplifiers were even used in early mixing consoles for the signal bus. This preamp uses a much beefier transformer than most modern tube preamps because it is connected to a power amplifier. Another unique feature of this preamp is the plate voltage is supplied by a switch mode power supply instead of a power transformer. This reduces the weight of the preamp as well as the parts cost and moves most power supply noise outside the range of human hearing. The filaments of the tubes are driven with the same 12 volt DC power supply that powers the SMPS plate supply. Another unique design choice is this preamp has no tone control and instead, just as was done in many old designs, the tone of the preamp is changed by changing parts. Once you have built it to your liking, the tone never changes. The main benefit is fewer moving parts and no extra parts to reduce output signal. If you are wondering what it sounds like, I'm using it right now. My recording rig consists of a Neewer condenser mic package, which contains a mic, windscreen, shock mount, and phantom power supply. The entire mic kit costs less than most average quality mics. This is connected to the preamp with a balanced to unbalanced cable, no matching transformer, and it is recorded at 1696 with the line in on my sound card. The video production process drops the sampling rate to 4800. The computer I make videos with has no special recording interface. I am not using any effects or doing any post-processing. In fact, I never even use a compressor. I do not have a studio or soundproofing, and there are ambient noises such as my computer, the furnace, and or the refrigerator that sometimes intrude on the sound. I am using basic modern production Chinese tubes. The caps are orange drops. These components could be changed to drastically alter the overall vibe and tone of the preamp. I will get into some of the details on that when we come to them in the next video. I have to give a shout out to Greg Forbin. It was because of his videos I discovered the Taylor Edge SMPS that drives the plates on this preamp. Greg uses these SMPSs to build some amazing sounding small practice guitar amps. I link to his channel in the description below. After this video, go check him out. There is also a link to the Taylor Edge site where you can buy the SMPS boards. Alright, let's get into vacuum tubes. The story goes that vacuum tubes were invented by Edison on accident. He was trying to build a light bulb and the filament kept burning out. He decided to install a second piece of wire to measure the temperature. To his surprise, the measurements on the second wire were not as expected. Edison had accidentally built a diode and discovered thermionic emissions. Current would flow from one filament or wire to another. It was not long before someone figured out by placing a third conductor in the form of a grid between the two wires, the current flow could be changed by changing the charge on the grid. Thus was born the triode. It was also discovered that indirect heating of the cathode would have the same effect of creating thermionic emissions. Indirect heating separates the filament windings from the hot cathode. This helps to reduce noise from the filament power supply. 
This preamp uses two dual triode tubes with indirectly heated cathodes. This is how this type of tube operates. Filament voltage is supplied. The filaments heat up. The filaments heat up the cathode and it releases electrons in the form of thermionic emissions. This warm-up time is the most obvious side effect of using vacuum tubes. The circuit has to warm up, unlike solid-state electronics that are ready as soon as they receive power. The plate of the tube is given a large positive charge or electron deficit by the high voltage supply. The plate takes in electrons from the cathode at a given rate at rest, which is based on the plate supply voltage and the cathode bias. As the grid becomes charged or discharged, it changes or modulates the current flow from plate to cathode. Remember, current flows opposite from electrons. 12AX7 and 12AT7 have the same basic pinout, but different current carrying and gain characteristics. The pinout of these tubes is as follows. Pin 1, plate 1. Pin 2, grid 1. Pin 3, cathode 1. Pin 4, filament 1. Pin 5, filament 2. Pin 6, plate 2. Pin 7, grid 2. Pin 8, cathode 2. And pin 9, filament center tap. This is what a vacuum tube looks like in a schematic. This is two halves of a triode wired in series. Series triodes act as two independent triodes. Each half acts as an independent amplifier. This is two halves of a triode wired in parallel. Parallel wired triodes are pretty good as power amplifiers as they can carry double the current of a single triode. On to resistors. Resistors are used to adjust the resistance of a circuit. Resistance is measured in ohms and different resistors have different wattage ratings. Resistors come in a wide range of materials and sizes. To identify the value of a large resistor, sometimes the value is printed directly on the resistor itself. Most small resistors have color-coded stripes to identify their value. Most of the resistors in this project are small half-watt resistors. The only exception is the resistors used to filter and buffer the high-voltage plate supply. As the plates on the tubes can pull a couple of watts between them, I used 5-watt resistors for this purpose. Too low of a wattage rating and the resistors could burn up. This is the schematic symbol of a resistor. This is how resistors are labeled on a schematic. Sometimes only the value is listed and sometimes the R number is listed to help reference a parts layout. This chart shows you how to read the color-coded stripes. You can also directly measure the value of a resistor with a multimeter set to ohms. Now a little bit about capacitors. Capacitors allow AC current to pass, but block DC current. Capacitors also act similar to batteries, as they can be charged and discharged. The two types of capacitors we will be dealing with in this project are electrolytic and film capacitors. Electrolytic capacitors have a polarity, but film capacitors do not. Because electrolytic capacitors have a polarity, they are not good for passing audio signals that ideally should swing negative and positive equally. Electrolytics are much cheaper to produce and purchase than film capacitors and offer a higher rating per cent spent. These features make them an excellent choice when we want to make filter circuits. In this project we use electrolytic capacitors for filters and as cathode bypass capacitors. For DC blocking on the plates and signal coupling, we will be using film capacitors. Now on to transformers. Transformers are a type of inductor. We will be using a reverb driver transformer for this project. This is a simple small wattage audio transformer that is designed to be used with vacuum tubes and is readily available. A transformer such as this one has a ferromagnetic core and two sets of windings. The primary winding in this case will connect the high voltage to the plate of our 12AT7. The primary winding is close to the ideal impedance for our 12AT7. This is important because too low of an impedance could allow the tube to pull too much current. Too high and the tube draws less current and loses output power. The audio transformer in a tube amp is a step down transformer that matches the high impedance output of the tube to a low impedance load. 
I use a speaker for the low impedance load. Common loads for this sort of device are reverb tanks, speakers, magnetic recording heads, record cutters, or other low impedance high current loads. The step down transformer reduces voltage and increases amperage. More amperage is needed to drive low impedance inductive loads. It is important to always load the output with something of the proper impedance. No load can cause mayhem with the tube and transformer. If you are not driving an inductive load which has varying reactance, which adds to the vibe of the output, at least drive a resistive load of a high enough wattage rating to not cause damage. A 5 to 10 watt wire wound resistor rated around 8 ohms should be sufficient. Now a little about variable resistors or potentiometers. These are basically a voltage divider that has adjustable values. A voltage divider is two resistive loads in series. If one side of the voltage divider is connected to positive, the other side is connected to ground, and the resistors each have the same value, then the voltage measured where they connect will be exactly one half of the circuit's supply voltage. Resistors and filaments are resistive loads. In the 12A series of tubes, the filaments are each designed to run on 6 volts. The two filaments are wired in series inside the tube, and the two ends are connected to pins 4 and 5. There is a center tap on pin number 9. If you are supplying them with 12 volts, you connect positive and ground to pins 4 and 5. Measured across both filaments, the voltmeter will say 12 volts. Measured to center tap, the apparent voltage is 6 volts. Thus, each filament only sees 6 volts. A potentiometer is simply a variable voltage divider. The center pin of a potentiometer has its resistance adjusted to each of the outside pins as the knob is turned. While the resistance to one pin referenced to center goes up, the resistance to the other pin referenced to center goes down. Now a little bit about how everything is connected together and held in place. I use two types of wire in this preamp. Most of the hookup is done with basic multi-strand or solid core copper wire, and the audio signal path uses a shielded cable to reduce noise. I used old-style point-to-point terminal strips to point-to-point -point wire all the components in a traditional 50s and 60s fashion. Two pins on each of my strips are attached to the chassis ground. If you prefer, you can build this with perf board, turret boards, or even printed circuit boards. My drawings are for terminal strip construction of the tube portion of the circuit, because that's how I built mine. I did use a perf board for the power section, as it was the simplest way to organize both the SMPS and filter circuits. Perf boards are insulated circuit boards with copper rings and pre-drilled holes. Components may be soldered to the boards and wire or component leads are used to form circuits. The chassis or case should be metal to block and reduce electromagnetic interference. I repurposed an old digital delay unit to use for this purpose. It provided me with potentiometers, op amps, and a solid steel chassis. It's important to reuse materials as much as possible, as recycling and remanufacturing takes more energy than reuse and repurposing. This concludes the first video in the Tube Preamp Build series. Go to my website, www.circuitsecrets.com, to download the schematic, parts list, and layout for the preamp. In my next video, we will examine the schematic and parts layout in detail. We will also cover some more advanced topics about tube circuits, electronics, and this preamp. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe.